Hi, welcome to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. In this episode, we're thrilled to have a special guest, Sandra Van Stee, the founder of Moral Eats. And he also has his own podcast on our channel. So take a look at his podcast and all the different great podcasts that he's done previously. He has a lot of great information and you'll find it very interesting. Now, we're going to explore how Sandra's passion for improving animal welfare led to the creation of Moral Eats, a platform that allows you allows your food choices to be positively impacted and impact the lives of farm animals. So join us as we dive into the transformation power of ethically sourced animal products and learn how you can make a difference in the industry. So tune in now for an engaging discussion on sustainability, human farming practices, and the future of our food. Now today, Sander, you wanted to talk about specifically a couple uh, specific topics. So why don't you fill us in on some of the things that you really have uh, thought about that you think our, our listeners need to know about? That's true. And, I, and the one thing that I really want to touch on is like a lot of these things that we're trying to do with more leads is improve the lives of farm animals. And we're trying to further regenerate agriculture and apply that to commercial agriculture and also just be an example for farms and stuff like that. But what I want to touch on today is that there's actually a new number of benefits to the actual person consuming these products. That There's lots of health benefits. It's not just you're doing something positive for the environment or for the welfare of the animals, but the products are actually healthier themselves. They're yeah. more nutrient dense. So I want to touch on how they're healthier, what's healthier about it, and like the science behind it. Excellent. Now, a lot of people, you know, in our society, like we've talked about this in our previous podcast, they don't realize um, all the different uh, artificial ingredients that goes into a lot of these foods, even foods that are um, dairy or meats. Um, they don't realize that a, a lot of the foods that aren't naturally organic or really organic um, you have a lot of different hormones and different artificial substances put into the into the uh, food to keep them fresh longer, to make them more plump, to make them look better. And it's really important to know where you're getting your dairy, where you're getting your meats, and you know, because it, it has a huge impact on our health. Everything we put in our body, you know, plays a big role on how we think, how we feel, how we act, our clarity in our mind, our focus. So, you know, explain to people why it's so important to really be able to, um, you know, uh, get healthier sources of food and how it plays such a huge impact on our lives. Yeah, there's a, a constant growing trend towards chronic disease in our in a society and in, in more recently, a lot of autoimmune conditions. So the, the health is a growing problem and that we're getting better at treating disease mm -hmm. and like intervening in the cases of heart attacks and cancers and stuff like that. So like this potential uh, like uh, the the actual rates of deaths are decreasing. But at the same time, the rates of people getting sick are increasing. So like people are living longer with these diseases, but that's not necessarily a great quality of life. But then on top of that, also for me personally, I I spend a lot of time thinking about what I'm eating and the habits and the, and the lifestyle habits that I do day to day because being healthy just makes you more effective at everything you do. If you're a mom, it makes you a better mom. You have more energy for your children, more patience for yeah. their temper tantrums. Like, uh, and for me, like I'm a if I'm a as a husband, like it, it gives me more energy too to like after a long day to have, still have time and energy to spend time with my wife and, and appreciate her presence and listen to her and, and her day and stuff like that. And as far as like, I have a very physical job and I need to be able to perform at my best in order to make it through a long day of physical labor and still be there for my kids and be there for my wife. And, and it's not just that, like I'm trying to create change in the agriculture industry and, and these things don't happen on their own. And especially when the stage where we are right now, where we're trying to build that momentum and get that ball rolling, there's so much more friction at just getting things off the ground. So I really need to perform. I, I try to treat myself like an athlete and I really encourage more people to take that mindset 
And because most of us play some sort of sports or some sort of competitive activity when we were kids. And then we seem to forget to apply that to our lives as adults. Yeah. And I would really encourage people just to treat their body like a temple, which is what you hear quite often, or just to look at your life as if you are a professional athlete and your profession, your your sport is your life, your your dreams and your relationships, all of that. And, you know, it, it's it's so important because you made such a great point. You know, we should treat our, our body like a temple because a lot of times people don't realize, but the reason why our illnesses are on a rise and you see diabetes has tripled and you see a lot more heart problems and high cholesterol and all these other things that have come about, like you said, autoimmune disorder and, you know, disease and it's a lot of has to do with the foods we put into our body. You know, if our body doesn't recognize, you know, the ingredients in these foods and they can't break it down, they just store it in our body. And if they store it in our body, um, it just, it just stays there. And over time it, it slows down the organs. It slows down, you know, your function and your ability to even have a strong immune system. And people over time, they start to feel different symptoms. They don't know what's going on. They go to the doctor, the doctor gives them a medication, it hides the symptom. And then all of a sudden, you know, so a lot of times people will have a side effect from that medication and they'll go back and they'll get a second and a third when it could all be solved by eating the right healthy foods and fresh foods, which is a big thing that people have to realize is that what are healthy foods and why when you go into a supermarket or if you're visiting a farm market, you know, what do you look for and, you know, what are the best practices to, to, to do to make sure that you really, you know, you know, store the right foods in your home for you and your family. So you can feel athletic and energetic and be your best. That's right. And it's overly simple, but it's, it's more difficult in practice and it's simple because you just got to eat one ingredient foods and just buy one ingredient foods that are just that are in their natural form. And usually those are found around the perimeter of the grocery store. It's simple enough, but like in practice it's more difficult because there is not as much of a push in advertising and recommendations to eat these kind of foods because there's not as many profit points. And we seem yeah. to touch on food labeling almost every single time we speak. And it's like, as soon as somebody has adds some sort of process to it or adds a preservative to it or packaging and stuff like that, that's value add. Yeah. And the benefit from like the industry from the labeling is they can now, because it's been value added in the US or in Canada, you can now label that as a product of Canada or a product of the USA, when really it could have been imported from uh, South America, New Zealand, who knows where. And, and it could have been like, like process and everything there, but as long as they added value in, in some way, shape or form, which typically removes from the nutritional value of that food, because the more you process it, the more you damage the nutrients, Yeah. but uh, they consider that value add. And, and then, so there's, there's a lot of financial incentive to promote these products because every step, every every process along the path is a profit point for some sort of mass conglomerate or a big company. Yeah. So that's why it's, it's more difficult in practice. It doesn't seem to be top of mind and cause it's not in front of our face all the time with advertising and recommendations. And it's crazy how far up the line those things can go. Because like, if you look at who is funding the research and funding the organizations that are giving us advice, you look back at these massive food corporations and which is problematic as what well, is but even more so even more problematic is the the drug companies that are financing all these corporations which have real opposing um incentives their, their incentive their their profit comes from sick people so yeah. like why is a company that profits from sick people paying for it, the advice of food like is a a real conflict of interest. Yeah. It's like that shouldn't be allowed. It shouldn't even be legal. No. So like, even if, there, if it's well-intentioned to start off with, those conflicts of interest shouldn't be possible. 
But anyway, that's why it's more difficult to make these healthy choices. But like what you actually need to do is really quite simple. And it's just eat those whole foods, no preservatives, no additives, no packaging, and relearn the skill of preparing your own food. And, mm. and also retrain your taste buds to enjoy and appreciate simple foods right. that don't have sauces and ingredients and sugars and oils and whatever else. Like you're... You're, you're actually you, the what you eat on a regular basis that that's typically what you learn to enjoy the taste of if you don't eat salt for months at a time then as soon as you have something salty it's, oh, it's overpowering or or sugar for example if all you eat for sweets is is fruit the next yeah. time you have a piece of candy it's overpowering it's not even enjoyable yeah but like true. yeah so desensitized to these sensations that nothing really else tastes like food anymore nothing tastes good anymore so you almost have to get past that point retrain your taste buds and there's different ways you can fast forward that like through fasting and stuff like that but yeah over time you will adjust and then you'll appreciate just plain simple real food for what they are it's very true you know i i gave up a lot of things i started eating blander and in my stomach and my digestive system I actually started feeling much better once i started actually stopping those sauces and stopping all those salty foods. And, you know, I, I noticed a change in how I was feeling. I felt much better. I wasn't as bloated. I, you know, I, my stomach wasn't hurting me. Sometimes I'd wake up and I'd have like pain in my, in my stomach. And it would, a lot of times it would be after we go out to eat, if we go to a restaurant, you know, because it's all those saucy foods and all the sugar and the butters they use and, and it would be overwhelming, you know, olive oil and all this other stuff, you know, one, one whole meal. And it was, uh, you know, when I started to just eat more bland, I actually enjoyed it more. And my, my health started to actually improve. I felt better. What not, you know, put in all those extra sauces and you can, you, you know, I can only imagine the level of sugars, you know, that go into these foods as well, as much as salt. You know, so it does play a big role. You know, if, if you could learn to eat healthy and you could learn to prepare your own meals and you could learn to eat more naturally, it would make a huge impact on your health. And for people who struggle with weight gain, I think too, it would it would make a huge impact and and help them because obesity in our in our even in Canada and United States has increased tremendously over the past decade. Yeah, these foods are whole foods are more satiating by nature, either with higher fiber content or in the 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 amount of fat or protein that's in there. As a whole, whole foods are more satiating, which really helps with weight loss and health in general. But also when your body you eat a lot of whole foods, your body is getting what it needs. It's getting true nutrition. And then you don't have the same cravings. Yeah. Especially like if you if you get like those healthy fats, those um, I find personally like saturated fats, animal fats do wonders for curving cravings in general. Yeah. So like so when you it, it helps with your health and your weight loss on two fronts, as far as how satiating they are and also how nutrient dense they are, and the fact that you're giving your body what it needs so it doesn't need those cravings the same way. Yeah. And even people, sometimes they even think, you know, they, they go for margarine because they think it's healthier than butter and butter is actually healthier than margarine because it's more artificial, but people don't realize that they think it's, oh, less calories, less fats. It's healthier for you. And it's actually the opposite. Can agree more. That's right. Yeah. As, um, saturated fats have been villainized in society for a very long time. And that's when margarine came up, but it was, like and like and like um crisco as well like that's all yeah. was never even on the market it wasn't even part of our consumption patterns in the past it was just used for industrial lubricants yes and then 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 they started changing all these recommendations and try to move the popul population away from saturated fats and then that's when all these highly processed oils that we could then substitute in the in a solid form like that's when those started coming on the market and yeah it's definitely been it's definitely caused havoc to the health of the population all these low fat recommendations and moving away from saturated fat and it kind of blows my mind it's like you know they, they went towards all these processed you know foods and all these processed oils and process is so bad for you but they they wanted to um 
they wanted to kind of like switch it from from regular regular healthy fats to go in, into these into these you know artificial you know processed foods you know and it, it, it just doesn't make sense to me it, it really doesn't why they would want to make that turn and why they think it would be better for the public you know that's right and it's not completely well understood like trans fats have, have been shown inconclusive like conclusively to be unhealthy but like also like our bodies are made up of saturated fats and yeah. like the hormones like the cholesterol and stuff like that and the cells it's all built off of saturated fats and cholesterols and once we stop consuming that we start consuming all of these seed oils and margarines and processed oils because we're monogastric we we only have that one stomach we we absorb those fats as is yeah and then the building blocks that we have for our body we start building our body with all these franken oils <laughs> and like they these these oils that we wouldn't naturally be part of our diet in such a high quantity and that's what we start building our body off of we have all the cell walls in our body are now have these much higher levels of these different kind of fats that not naturally sh shouldn't even be there they're they're meant to be saturated fats and cholesterols those are our natural fats we build them ourselves yeah and, but then uh yeah but if we have all these all these oils and stuff as part of our diet we incorporate those as well and there is some research supporting how that it could affect things like the mitochondria and how they function and stuff like that and just the overall health of our cells but yeah it, the jury's still out on that but i can't imagine that's good for us no me either you know um, I, I think really people really need to start really focusing on what they put in their bodies. Cause I, I tend to get really upset when I see how much, you know, our society has changed health wise, you know, the level of, of, uh, diseases that have increased all the different things, you know, even ADHD has, is on a rise. Why is that? You know, a lot of times people talk about diet, diet related, you know, a lot of the foods that we, we put in our body. You know, even the people love ramen noodles and you can buy them for like pennies in, in a supermarket, but they, they have chemicals in them that could actually trigger in your brain and make you addicted to the ramen noodles because of the of the ingredients in, in, in the sauces and, and in, in the ramen noodles. And um, it's kind of scary, you know, and, you know, um, people really have to think about, you know, what they want for their future. Do they want to prevent illness or do they want to stay healthy and, and live a happy life? Because I know for me, even if I live a long life, I don't want to live a long life having a disease or a disorder and have to suffer, you know, the rest of my life. I want to be healthy. And I think the only way is 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 that we really focus on food and the and the foods we put in our in our bodies. And like you said, treating our body like it's a temple. You know, it's an old saying, but it's so true. That's right. And like eating those whole foods, that's the lion's share of the diet advice. That's like no matter what kind of fad diet or diet that's out there, that's the one rule that, that they could all agree on is to move away from the processed foods, move towards the whole foods. And that would make the biggest difference. And then like and then after that, you start having you can start nitpicking all the details and and you once you have that basically that habit ingrained then you start moving towards things like oh well what kind of whole food should we eat should we look for the organic should we look for the grass-fed or do we look for something that's regenerative which isn't even much in those grocery stores yeah like, and then you start moving towards finding suppliers that are not that are not the grocery store but actually true local and and uh seasonal foods that are from your your neighbors from your farmers and actually get to know them and buy food directly from them yeah and then that's when you start enjoying some of the added benefits of of like once you have those foods you have that habit well then you start moving towards okay now what is the best way that we can produce food and then yeah and then you start using that as a as a real vote towards how food should be produced right and there's so many farms out there, like even I, I live in an area where it could be very busy, but, you know, we you drive a few minutes and there's tons of farms, you know, um, you know, if people took the time out just to go, you know, and, and to go visit 
those farms. You'll see all the time they'll have their 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 markets on the side, you know, and they'll be they'll sell their products or they'll they'll even have an entrance into the farm and they'll have stores, you know, in, embellished into their into their farmland where you can go in and you could actually purchase the products, you know. And uh and e-commerce is getting very popular too. Like that's something that where we apply with our farm, like we don't have a farm store, but we started moving heavily towards trying to get the e-commerce and having an online store. And then it doesn't even matter necessarily if you're if the farmer is half an hour away or if you don't have a car or something like that, like they'll deliver it to you. That's what we do as well within Ontario. Like we deliver our products to the to them. So we try and make it as convenient as possible because you try you gotta compete with uh, the grocery stores and your your people are going to the grocery stores already and it's out of convenience and then so they would we, we try to make it as convenient as possible as well and so we deliver it to people's doors so they don't even have to leave their house and right. like all those foods are at their doorstep and they just got put it in their freezer that's great you know that's and that's something that like a lot of places are starting to do now that they deliver but to have how to have fresh food from a farm deliver your food that is amazing because you don't even you know you i don't even hear about that you know but that that's a great service to have that definitely is a great service to have you know i think that encourages people to want to buy farm fresh food because now they can easily order it and it could be delivered to them so the hassle of trying to go there or not being able to drive because you might be a little older and you know, whatever the case may be, it makes it a lot easier for the person. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a big part of it, trying to decrease any barriers that they might have towards that. I think that's great. I think that's great. And what about people like who live in the city? You know, do you recommend places like Whole Foods and 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 places like that? Do you, do, can you find a lot of um, farm fresh foods in those type of um, facilities, or is it usually you don't you don't find a lot of farm fresh foods in in stores like Whole Foods or stores that have, are known to sell a lot of organic products? Yeah, I don't want to get people stuck in the weeds. There's definitely. <laughs> Right. Like, so like, yeah, like you first, it doesn't matter what grocery store you stick on the perimeter. That's, that's a big step. And you yeah. went to Whole Foods. That's an improvement. There's usually a better selection of Whole Foods there, which might make it easier for you to stick to eating in that way. There's a little more variety. It's definitely an improvement, but like, even then, how fresh is the, are those Whole Foods? Because things like fruit and vegetables, they're usually picked when they're not ripe and then they can be shipped around the world and they ripen along the way. And then they're they're treated with different sort of gases and stuff like that. So the environment, so they they can manage as far like when does this fruit ripen? But right. there's consequences. Like there there's 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 a very big difference, especially with things like fruit. And like is if it ripens on the vine, the amount of nutrition and the sugars and like the 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 toxins that are removed from these products that are actually ripened on the plant and then picked ripe and then eaten shortly after that that doesn't compare like that is that's the ideal that's truly fresh yeah compared to like what you might have in a grocery store where it's not even picked ripe it doesn't even have that nutrition in it yet because right. it's still not much it's not, the plant wasn't quite ready to for it to be picked it wasn't putting in that nutrition into that fruit and wasn't ready to pull out the the defense chemicals that are trying to prevent it from being eaten too early None of that has happened yet. So then yeah. basically by definition, there's going to be less nutrition. There's going to be less sugars in fruits that are picked when they're not ripe yeah. just for the sake of, of that transportation and then having it ripe when it hits that grocery store shelf. Right. So yeah, there's, there's differences and like, but like, I don't want people to get discouraged. Um, like, and then like, like later on, we'll probably talk about like, the 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 benefits of like regenerative agriculture and the health benefits of that but it's like another step again it's an improvement but like the the big step is like eating those whole foods and then and then we'll hopefully without getting too stressed out about it, taking the steps further from there yeah i i think you know i never knew that i never realized that that you know, a lot of times it makes sense you know they will pull the foods before they're ripe because they need time to ship them and but you know if you if you if you pull them when they were ripe and then you ship them, most likely they will you know be almost bad or you have a very little time before they they go bad, and okay. 
And I've noticed that sometimes when I've gotten into food, into markets, I bought food that looked fresh, you know, in, in the fresh produce aisle, like, you know, vegetables and, and, um, and fruits. And then I brought them home the next day. They were actually bad. You know, they went bad within a day. And it was probably, you know, if I had to guess from what you're saying, it was probably, you know, it was picked right away. And, you know, and then by the time it got here, you know, it had a very little limited time before it actually went bad. So, you know, I'm like, how could this, how could this go bad? I just bought it. It was fresh yesterday, you know, and I would be like, you know, I would be like very surprised. But uh, I had, when I yeah. have gone to like fresh food markets, it's, uh, it's great. It's like, I, I love going to fresh food markets and, and the people there are so friendly and everything is just fresh and they, they care. That's the difference is that you go into a supermarket, they're just there to work. You go into a, into a, a farm market and they actually really have that love that you have and that compassion because they're, you know, they're, they're making, some, they're doing something that they, they love that they have a passion for. Yeah, like like we have some apple trees in our back in our in our backyard, and if I were to pick that apple and then buy compare that to an apple that you get from the grocery store that was picked when it wasn't ripe, you can measure the difference. You can measure the sugar levels, and that's just from the like yes, also the way it's produced. Uh, it may have came out from unhealthy soils, but also just the fact that one's picked ripe and the other one's picked green. Right, right. And I never thought about that, you know, like I never, I thought, you know, I never thought about the shipment and how they have to really, you know, get it before, before and make so much sense, you know, it makes so much sense. Yeah. And I, we have to appreciate it for what it is. The fact that we can all around the world have all this fresh fruit. It's incredible that that's even possible. Like it's a, a real um, wonder of modern ingenuity that that's even we can you do that but like yeah it comes with consequences and like uh, the ideal is that you you eat food that is local and seasonal and it's always either fresh or if like like right in the winter like you can have pickled stuff like that and like yeah. can't, like the old school back to the old school ways of, of preserving foods like that was still picked fresh and then fermented in some way or another and you have the added benefit of those healthy bacteria yeah. like that's would be a step further for sure. Oh, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. I, I, I think it's, um, it's really great that you bring up these points because I think it's really important for people to understand, you know, the, the importance. And when people look for food, is there any suggestions that you give them that, you know, what they should start, you know, they really should look for if they're, if they're buying, if they're buying food, or even if they're going to a, a um a farm market do you have any suggestions for people i know you I feel, said... go ahead yeah i feel like if you like from what i mentioned before like if you buy truly locally grown that was picked ripe that's great and then on top of that if you happen to have farmers that produce foods in a regenerative way that's also a huge step forward because like that food that's produced in a, in a regenerative way, it, it has the added benefit of the nutrient density from from uh, the way it was produced. So like, let, let me, if you let me take a, a step back. Yeah. Uh, regenerative agriculture is basically when you produce food in a way that improves the health of the soil. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you unlock basically the natural ways that the plant can get nutrients from the soil. So you start adding synthetic fertilizers like your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium. Right. That plant is able to get the nutrition that it needs to survive, not necessarily thrive, but it has the and, and you'll you'll fertilize for more things than just those three nutrients. But when yeah. you when you start fertilizing for these 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 big nutrients, then all of a sudden the plant it loses the ability to communicate with these healthy microorganisms in the soil. And that communication happens through the excretion of sugars. The plant excretes these sugars. And then depending on what sugars it, it excretes, it basically gets different nutrients in return. And then the whole microorganism, that whole ecosystem survives and lives off of these sugars. And right. that's like the foundation of this food chain. 
So then as soon as you start adding these synthetic fertilizers, the plant no longer needs these nutrients. It no longer exc excretes these sugars in order to get them. It yeah. has plenty. So then the the food chain collapses because it doesn't have the sugars from from the plants. Right. And then so then now the the because the ecosystem isn't there, even if a plant wanted to, it wouldn't be able to get the nutrition from the soil because there's no microorganisms there to mine it and to transport it and to trade it. So like and then that's what that's at that point on, you're basically addicted to using these synthetic fertilizers. Right. The problem, like yeah, because like if you wanted to stop using these synthetic fertilizers, like what we're trying to do on our farm, and you're trying to move away from it, all of a sudden you have no yield, you have you can't produce food, and then you have no way of paying your bills. Like it's not that simple. Yeah, you need to introduce that life, reintroduce that that diversity, and then you have to maintain it. And there's there's five principles that that you need to follow in order to do that, and those. You you do that naturally when you're rotationally grazing, yeah. But for like fruit production, vegetable production, or row crops, or your grains and stuff like that, you have to be much more intentional to follow these principles. Right. So like the to like as a reminder, those principles are you have to minimize the disturbance, mm -hmm. whether it be fertilizers or, or or tillage or in any way, shape, or form. You need the biodiversity, especially yeah. the different plants and the different microorganisms. You need to have armor on the soil so you need to like protect that soil from the burning sunlight you need to have living roots under the soil because the microorganisms they they live in association with those roots so if the roots aren't there if you don't have living roots the microorganisms start to die off and the last thing is you need the animal impact so a lot of that is more difficult to accomplish when you're doing things like row cropping because yeah. typically those happen in in completely separate farms in different locations than where we are raising the animals. Right. So we need to incorporate that, reintegrate these different specialties and then have all those and then follow these principles carefully. But yeah, so when we do accomplish that, then you you have this this beautiful synergy between the plant and the and the organism in the soil where it can ask for any nutrition that any nutrients that it wants. But also these Organisms help defend the plant, and then and then there's all these beneficial microorganisms. So then there you have less of a chance of growing these pathogenic organisms. Yeah, you don't need the pesticides and the herbicides in the same way. So like it, it, it all kind of works together. But as soon as you give them synthetic fertilizers, the plant then doesn't have that ability doesn't have the ability to ask for anything that it wants yeah just for the nutrients that you're fertilizing for but you can't possibly fertilize for every single nutrient that you could possibly find in the soil right. so as a result your your plant is less nutrient dense you and then and it starts with the soil but then you have the plants are less nutrient dense the animals that are eating those plants those animals become, they have less nutrition. Yeah. So then less nutrient dense and it works its way up to our plate to where our food is less nutrient dense. Right. And you, you can measure the the huge change over the years of like, of like typical foods back in the seventies or even earlier. And then the amount of nutrition there compared to today, the, the difference is scary. Yeah. And so then like so like where do we go from there so when you when you have all these regenerative practices in place and you have that nutrition the you can actually measure the difference in the nutrient nutrient density it's not just a theory anymore the science have been done they've taken biopsies from an animal that was raised on grass and finished on grass yeah taking a biopsy of that muscle mm -hmm. and then they compared it to a similar animal that was that was finished on grains and raised with your typical commercial farm with uh, that's grain finish, and they they compare these two muscle biopsies, and there's they actually found that there was less evidence of aging in the animal that was finished on grass. There was wow. less proteolysis, less oxidative stress, less um, like glycation end products, mm -hmm. all signs of aging. And there was dramatically less when they're when they're finished on grass. Like not surprisingly, a healthier animal yeah. produces healthier food. 
So then when you actually look at the, the, the nutrition in this craft finished products, it's higher in omega-3. That's very well established. Yeah. But it's also higher in, in vitamin A and E and um, higher in um, antioxidants. But there's also, amazingly, you can find phytonutrients. So like these grass-fed products are actually a good source of phytonutrients, which is nutrients that came originally from plants. Yeah. So, you, so, but it's not just the phytonutrients that you find in the, the, in the muscle or in the, in the meat, you don't, it's not just from the plants where those plant derived phytonutrients, you actually have nutrients that originated from the microorganisms and in the soil from all the fungi you have yeah. phytonutrients that fungus that came from the soil. Like it, it works its way all the way up to the food chain. And those have a long list of different benefits, mostly around anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, which like yeah. that, that's basically the inflammation you could argue is like the root cause of all disease. Like it makes a massive difference. Yeah. But it, and you can measure that. You can measure the difference between regeneratively raised products and then your typically raised typical commercial products. Yeah. So like if, if you can, and then like, if I extend that then to what we're doing in our farm, especially, we're really focused on the welfare side of things. Yeah. And you, if you know, you can measure the difference in, anti-inflammatories and antioxidants stuff like that well stress chronic stress has been very well documented to increase inflammation in your body and 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 uh, use up your antioxidants and basically is like a, a root cause of lots of different lists of, of diseases that we suffer from a lot of stress related conditions yeah so like if you so it's not a stretch of imagination to say like if you have animals that are chronically stressed you have animals that will have more inflammatory markers less antioxidants less anti-inflammatories in it compared to the animal that's not chronically stressed yeah but like it becomes very important to that you you meet all the needs the basic needs of these animals but also the fact that they're just that they're just handled with respect and mm -hmm. with kindness and patience yeah so like, like those, those are those are also critical so like and like that's when you could potentially, not necessarily, but potentially run into issues when you have a massive farm where it's owned not by a farmer, but by a, a group of investors. And then you have people working on the farm that are not as invested in in, in the actual production of the food or, or the, yeah. the lifestyle. And then there's, there's coming there, they're showing up for a paycheck. Right. And, you, and then like, and then on top of that, they're incentivized for getting through their shift on time and being efficient because we it's a business you, you, you have to stay profitable yeah and so then like so then you have the you have the wrong incentive you have a person that just wants to get these like for the for a dairy farm example you have the, these these employees that are incentivized to get these animals through the parlor as quick as possible yeah and that's what and then and then on top of that they aren't necessarily passionate about animals they just want to get their paycheck and go home to their family yeah like you it's you are creating all of the the foundation for animal abuse like right. it doesn't necessarily happen but like the foundation is there like the the incentive structure is incorrect right Whereas like if you have somebody that is farming because they love farming and they're passionate about it or they can or they they like, in my case like i'm i came to farming because of my passion for working with animals like i you naturally have much more patience for these animals. Yeah. If that's why you got into the business in the first place. Yeah. So things like that, like chronic stress, not surprisingly, would make would make a big difference if you look at what the what was actually found in these biopsies. Yeah. But also acute stress. So like the also has an impact on 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 meat. So if you there's, there's a couple of conditions called DFD, like dark, firm, and dry, and yeah. PSC, soft and exudative. And if you have an animal that's acutely stressed in the last moments of its life, you, you have these, these conditions that taste terrible, that are leaking nutrients everywhere, and yeah. doesn't look nice either. But it's not just black and white, you have these conditions or you don't. Yeah, It's on a spectrum. Right. So the more stress the animal is, you have that you have more of that lactic acid and that acidity is what, is what created is creating these conditions in the muscles. 
it's on a spectrum. So like the better these, the more ethical the slaughter process is, the more humane it is, it has a massive impact on the quality of the final product. Right. And what that looks like, a lot of people consider humane slaughter as an oxymoron. Yeah. But like, basically, that's just, you're just treating these animals with respect and you're minimizing stress to the, as much as you possibly can throughout the whole process. Right. My eyes, it's humane slaughter. And what that looks like is what, like, what we do with our beef is like we drop them off the day before slaughter. So they are, are already getting used to the new environment. And then they also are put in a pen. So they need to form a new social hierarchy. And then that is all stress. And also the transportation. Most animals that are brought to slaughter have never been on a truck before in their life. And you can imagine that's a, a very strange sensation if you don't understand what transportation is. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have four walls that aren't moving, but your ears are telling you that you're moving. And like, that would be stressful. Yeah. Like there's some stress that's, that's unavoidable. But then right. when you bring them there the day before, they have a chance to get used to their new environment and then they can relax. And then the next day they can be moved from their from their pen where they spent the night and they yes. can move down a corridor. And like and like these corridors need to be designed in a very particular way so that you can minimize stress. Like the traction of the floors is critical so mm -hmm. that the, the animals can walk with confidence and not hesitate. Yes. And then and then also like quite often you'll find that these corridors, they are they're almost always going around like a little slight bend. So it mm -hmm. feels like the animals kind of going somewhere. They're they're rounding that bend, trying about to, to get to the destination. Yeah. And quite often also moving from like a darker spot to a lighter area. It needs to be really well lit where they're heading. Yeah. So they see where they're heading and then they, they have that extra confidence as well. And also just things like like a beam of light crossing the path. Right. Or, or like a shirt or, or something or a shovel or whatever to the side, stuff like that. Like that's all things that the, the animal can have a look and will be like, Hey, what's this? And then stop and have a look. And then if things like that happen, well then the, the, they also need to be chased forwards in order to continue moving. Yeah. And then that stress again, being chased that like you want the animals to naturally want to continue moving forward. And, and all this has been done by like through through the work of of, of um uh temple grandin right. she's a, a woman that has made a massive improvements on the the slaughterhouses in general and mm -hmm. the process and improving the the standards so she's a, some a woman that has had a massive impact on animal welfare through her work with uh with slaughterhouses and, and improving them but yeah so then when you do that the animal keeps moving forwards and then at the end of this corridor they're hit with a captive bolt they don't understand where they're going. All they know yeah. is that at the end of this road, they're hit the cat, the bolt, they're knocked unconscious. Right. And then at that point on, the animal feels nothing. It has no idea what's going on. And a lot of these videos that surface it can look brutal. But you have to remember once they're once they're hit with that cat the bolt, they're completely senseless. They're they yeah. they don't feel anything. And then they're usually hung up and then they're they're the blood blood is drained. And then, and then like, and then the process continues, but yeah, like that's in my eyes, is humane slaughter. You just, you're going down this corridor and then you're not unconscious. Wow. Like better way to go than what most humans experience where you have this long period of suffering and disease yeah. and then, and then you don't have this quick painless end is it's, it's a lot of suffering. And then, and then it's a step even, even more so it's even better than what these prey animals would experience naturally right it's like like nature doesn't care about welfare nature doesn't care about how much you suffer it's just it's just following the circle of life right. so like if that predator, it doesn't if, if it catches you and it starts eating like that's that's a horrible way to die as, as like to yeah. as you slowly bleed out and as the animals is is like eating your bowels and stuff like that it's, it's a horrible way to go and like also just like the chase beforehand very stress inducing like what we what we've uh, uh, is what what's possible with humane slaughter is really incredible if you consider like what is normal for prey animals right and like and in europe things like there's they they can they can take it a, a step further like there's some 
um, spots in Europe where you can have access to a mobile shelter, which is even better because the the animal never has to leave what's familiar. It never has to leave uh, the farm and, and like the barns and stuff where where it grew up and where it spent its days because okay. the mobile the, the slaughterhouse actually comes to the farm. Like oh. unfortunately in Canada, I haven't heard anything in the U.S. either. It's not it's not available. That business okay. doesn't exist. But like that would be a step improvement over even what is what like what we're currently doing. It's just right. uh, we need that business to in order to go down that road and have that be an option. Yes, definitely, definitely. That's pretty interesting. Wow. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today and emphasize it into like a couple takeaways, what would you want to tell the listeners today from our discussion? That they do have a significant amount of power to create change in agriculture. Yeah. You're not powerless. And and that and you don't accomplish that by making posts on social media saying, oh, this needs to change and stuff like that, or, or complaining. Like yeah. it's literally through supply and demand. You create that demand for certain products and that way of producing food will increase. Like it'll become more popular. Right. And then like that's how like these, these, these movements like regenerative agriculture or or just treating your animals humanely those things can can grow as long as they have a place to bring their products yeah and and demand for those products and then like and then that movement can grow and then we can have these positive impacts like improving animal welfare or improving the nutrient density and the health of of, of our food which which is great because like our animals are healthier too and then yeah. all, or like our environment like um and like improving the soil health is is improving the environment because like that you can one of the ways you can measure soil health is the amount of organic matter in the soil yeah and then on top of that also the diversity but that, the diversity of microorganisms that's all carbon as well all life forms are based off of carbon yeah and where does that carbon come from right it comes from the atmosphere from co2 the yeah. greenhouse gas and it's just being stored in the soil is being stored as a massive reservoir. It's, it's, it's an impressive how much of an impact you can have on the environment, how much carbon you can actually store in the soil yeah. and, and improve the environment. So like you can have all those impacts. You can improve the welfare. You can improve the environment. You can improve your own health just by being conscientious and voting with your food dollars. Right. Wow. That's amazing. This has been amazing. Now, tell before we go, tell people the different services that you provide. Yeah, we focused on animal products because mm -hmm. what we're really trying to do is we're trying to find ways to improve the lives of farm animals right. and do that supply and demand. So like it's completely self-sustaining, which I think is is a beautiful thing because like it it's it, it makes a profit while creating positive change. Yeah. So like it, is there it's a very sustainable solution to mm -hmm. welfare but and we focus on basically each product so all the products that we have we we try to raise it and produce it in a way that say like, how can we have a positive impact on welfare especially yes so for example we have our, our grass-fed beef they're actually crosses from dairy cows they're half beef half dairy and oh, that wow. allows us to take the bulk cash from the dairy industry, which normally would either be raised as veal or mm -hmm. raised as as grain finished steers in some areas. Like, but where where we where we farm, the veal industry is thriving. Which don't get me wrong, right. the veal industry is still a massive improvement over the alternative where the farmer can't even afford to keep a bull calf yeah. and then and has that life at birth. Like that's is it like the veal industry is a massive improvement over that. But for our beef, they don't living to be eight months old like they would with, with veal, and they're not living to be 15 or 16 months old like they would with grain finished steers or grain grain finished beef. They're living right. to be 20, 25, 26 months old. They're 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 living to maturity, to the mature size, they're adults. And then because it takes longer to finish these animals on grass, like they they have a longer life and they have a life on pasture. So like yeah. we're using the beef as a as a vehicle to improve the lives of these of these uh of these beef animals. And then like our turkeys as well, like our turkeys they're they follow in behind our beef. They're they're actually 
rotationally grazed, just like our yeah. beef animals. And and then they so they're they're out in nature. They're they're basically have the same synergy that you would find in nature where you'd have wild birds right. following these massive herds of bison. They have that same, our, the, the, the birds in our, the turkeys in our farm, they have that same synergy with our, our beef herd where they follow behind our beef herd three days later. And then the, the beef, they, they, they eat the grass shorter. So the turkeys can yeah. actually walk through it. But then they also leave behind their manure patties, which attracts insects. The the flies are are laying larvae and stuff like that. And then there's dung beetles and everything else. And then the turkeys find these insects. They can eat the insects. They spread out these dung piles. Yeah. And they build that nutrition throughout the pasture. And then they're but they're also eating a significant amount of grass as right. well on the pasture and like and the other insects that they might find around. So like they're really in this synergistic system with nature, with with other animals on this pasture. So like so like we're using our, our our turkey products and stuff like that, also like as a way to like get them out in nature and and have that variety that the of of experiences in their life and the, the way they're moving around the environment. So like I find that as a, a way to improve welfare as well. And we and we focus on turkeys first over chickens because yeah. um, chickens are more challenging to really make a big impact on the quality of their lives because chickens typically live to be six weeks old before they're ready for slaughter. And that's a, just a very, very short life. Whereas right. in turkeys, actually they're, they're a bigger bird. They live longer. So I focus on turkeys first, but with chickens, like the way I intend to do it in the future is like you have dual purpose chickens. And then mm -hmm. these chickens, they, they take longer to finish because they're not as, they're not bred as intensively as the broiler chickens are. Yeah. So they, they have longer that way but also from the layers point of perspective is, is an improvement as well because the male birds have a use for the beef whereas oh, we okay. typically find in commercial poultry is that you have a breed of birds that are specifically bred just for laying eggs right and those that are hatched but the male chicks have no use right so they so they, their life ended right then and there which which is not ideal, obviously, for animal welfare. Yeah. So, like these dual-purpose birds, these these heritage breeds, they have a massive advantage from a welfare perspective because you you use the male and the female chicks, right? And then you have eggs, you have your your chicken. It's just, yeah, there's this cost involved because you have an an older bird before you send it out for slaughter, and then that older bird needs to be fed for more days. So there's, there's increased increased cost in producing it this way. Yeah. But that's that's for the future. That's like that's what we're hopefully going to start experimenting with this year, yeah. And then bring it up from there. But also like our the the pigs like they're 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 rotationally grazed much like the beef. They're out in nature. They're very curious animals. So they're and they're very intelligent. So like it's great for them to have that extra stimulation of being out in the environment and rooting yeah. and digging and chopping and looking for food. Like it and like the, the have that extra stimulation is really important for these pigs. Because they can get bored and frustrated. Yeah. And that's when they're doing all these crazy things like eat each other's ears and tails. Oh, wow. And stuff like that out of frustration because it's much like a dog cooped up in a house. These intelligent animals, like they, they, they yeah, they get bored. Yeah. And then, like, and then, like, and then we also want to move towards also a product that's not available yet, but we've been working towards for years is um, our dairy cows being able to raise their own calves is a, it would be a massive improvement in welfare yeah. because it's it's one of the ways to measure animal welfare is the ability of the cow to express their, their all their natural behaviors. And unfortunately, in commercial dairy farming, dairy cows don't have that opportunity to express their natural maternal behaviors. So it's, it's a beautiful thing to watch. But yeah, it's it, and like that's what we've been working towards for the last several years is finding a way and finding out all the hiccups and, the, and the, the issues along the way because there are plenty. There's lots and lots of good reasons why the dairy industry typically removes the calf from right. the mother. But it's not impossible to make it happen. It's not impossible. The proof is on our farm. You can see the healthy calves that are being raised by their mothers. It is possible, but it needs to be done intentionally and carefully with the proper environment and the proper management practices to really make that difference and make that make it so the calves stay healthy. So yeah, yeah, it is actually an improvement in welfare. So like those are all things that we're moving towards. Those are it's like 
yeah the the future is exciting the future yeah. is very exciting so like and all those products are produced in a way that by producing it we're making a difference in welfare right that's exciting very exciting now where can everyone find your website our website is moraleats.com so it's m o r a l e a t s.com and you can find all the information on there a lot of information about like what we talked about today and then in the other podcasts and also about like what we're doing with each individual animals and how we're trying to have that positive impact on animal welfare yeah. as well as well as like like and then like there's links on there too to our online store so like if you're in ontario you we deliver across on southern ontario and then and then if you're also like there's also links to um our our email list and then people that live in ontario they have the opportunity of signing up to the email list and being entered to win a free sample box so they can try out some of our products oh awesome that's very cool this has been great. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Sandra, for coming on the show today and sharing all this information. This is very valuable. I think people really need to understand more about regenerative agriculture and the benefits of it and how it could actually enhance and improve our health. And, you know, you've, you, you know, you know, toppled on all those topics today and, you know, and, and where we're going in the future. And, and it's very exciting because it seems like there's going to be a lot of changes in the fu near future for you guys. And, uh, I'm excited for you. Very excited. Yeah, I'm. I'm very excited as well. It's been a pleasure being on, being being on the podcast and having having the opportunity to to explain all this stuff and like the direction we want to go. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Oh, we we appreciate you. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. I can't wait to have you back on the show. You'll be back soon because you have a whole podcast series with us, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Likewise. Well, you have a great day. You too.